G'day legends, I hope that you're having a fantastic day. Now today we're going to go over some more that has happened between Ukraine and Poland and sort of the making up there, some strikes across Ukraine and of course Zelensky on tour in the States and as well at the end we'll have a look over the maps and some other little bits and pieces that I found interesting over today. But I'm not going to BS you, very little has actually really happened today. Like putting this together, I was struggling and This has actually been a common theme over the past, say, week or so. There's been very little happen in a period where we thought, you know, coming to the end of this counteroffensive, you know, three and a half months in that we would be right at the crux of big moves happening, yet we're still in what seems to be the beginning movements for second lines of this. And I guess that could be a concern for where this is going. And we're going to speak a bit more on that, as more has come, as Zelensky's on the tour around the states, Washington, New York, and well, of course, I said Washington, but he's in Washington with President Biden, meeting with high ranking officials, the media, all of this. Now, it is obvious that Zelensky has ab- unwavering support, absolutely, from President Biden, but that Republican support does seem to be waning as Biden has approached Congress for another $24 billion in aid for Ukraine, with 28 Republicans signing you know, forms not wanting, requesting that this money doesn't then go on to Ukraine. And this could be a concern, as with the election next year, you know, there's been disappointing uh, counteroffensive results so far, the rising cost of living, the domestic issues in America – and all of this is actually fueling a lot of the pushback from officials as well as citizens. Looking inwards into America rather than outwards is a lot of the view and opinion of people. And of course, this is the voting base as well. Now, will it be the majority? We don't know. But this is where a lot of this pushback is coming from. And I read a lot of comments. I look at Biden, I look at all of this, and from what I see and read and as much as I can actually get in, there's a lot of people who are somewhat sick of like the constant demanding, I guess, of weapons and support. Now, you and I are probably people on the fringe of, you know, looking into the sort of crux of this war and what is going on, and we would know that this is exactly what Zelensky has to do. And we know that, you know, the US can afford it. But, you know, from just reading comments and articles and whatever, I'm starting to get the feeling that a lot of people are actually getting more turned off and turned away actually from this support. And, you know, that people don't want another drawn out war as, you know, a lot of Western countries, particularly America, you know, the cost of living is going up. There's a lot of problems at home, things like this. And, We did see that Zelensky did request, again, to address Congress like he did last year. But Speaker Kevin McCarthy has denied his request, saying, Zelensky asked us for a joint session. We just didn't have time. So maybe people are reading some more into this, but, you know, this has been where it is this complete support from one side and looking like there's some more wavering support of the other side. And we know it's an election year next year. And... This has raised concerns in Ukrainian media with the Kiev Independent writing today, well, titling today, saying the West lacks political will to ensure Ukraine's victory. And Zelensky has said words to the effect of, without aid, we will lose the war. Now, yesterday, speaking on politics, we well, there's only really politics today. And we'll look at the maps. There's some more stuff there. But yesterday, we did speak on how Poland was pulling back military support from Ukraine after Ukraine submitted legal action over the grain. And Ukrainian officials had some very sharp words, especially Zelensky at the UN, regarding the states which Poland took to heart. So the Polish president has said that his words were interpreted in the worst possible way. And now it does seem that the situation is starting to cool off between Poland and Ukraine. But as many have speculated, like we spoke about with Democrats, Republicans, that this could be a sign of things to come, especially now that it's come about, as we know, the Polish parliamentary elections are coming on October the 15th. So very close that these sort of moves are starting to happen from the sides of politics. And one thing we do know in all Western countries around the world, is there's more and more division between the left and right, or your Labor, Liberal, Democrat, Republican, wherever you are. 
there's more and more division between those and different views on how bloody everything should be done and as well as this war. But speaking about these grain things, the Ukrainian officials' comments, they also came under heavy scrutiny, scrutiny Sorry, from even the most pro-Ukrainian pages and bloggers. Like these guys who are even your NAFO sort of guys are like, what the fuck are they saying? They, Poland has done so much for us and sort of throwing it back in their face. Now, let's look over a couple of strikes. So Russia has really made its first strikes of the year against the critical infrastructure, trying to knock some of these electricity grids out like this. And once again, this will probably be the start to uh, Russia's campaign of taking out this for over the winter period, which they weren't successful last year, but it definitely put a lot of pressure onto that electricity grid, needing generators, uh, blackouts, things like this. So Alexei Kuluba, the deputy head of Kiev's uh, presidential office, has said, uh, difficult months are ahead. Russia will attack energy and critically important facilities. So uh, Ukraine then released this from the Air Force of the Armed Forces that they engaged and destroyed 36 of these missiles out of the 43 fired towards Ukraine. Now, of course, these are from TU-95s from Engels. Ukraine's energy supplier had this statement to say, State of the energy system of Ukraine on Thursday, September 21st, due to the consequences of enemy attack. My bins are getting picked up if you can hear that, <laughs> for the first time in six months, energy facilities were damaged in the western and central regions. As a result of the attack, there were partial blackouts in Rivni, Zemotor, Kiev, Dnipro, and Kharkiv regions. Due to the hostilities and other reasons, 398 settlements remain without electricity. Another thing that I actually wanted to have a look over too was this exchange I saw just between like two large like bloggers on Twitter. But I think there's some good points in this. So this bloke here says, imagine if Russia does a 300,000 mobilization, can't feed, can't arm, can't provide them vehicle, can't clothe, uh, who will train them, last group mobilize, blah, blah, blah. And then this bloke here has said, I agree that Russia can't provide vehicles and special equipment per organizational structure. But saying they can't feed or clothe them is disingenuous. It makes people think that we are fighting some insurgent army. And yet we're not in Crimea or Luhansk, which I think this last bit is um, something that where propaganda, like things like this, actually can sort of go against like Ukraine. Because if people are saying this and you're just fighting some like insurgency force, well, why isn't then Ukraine having more success against there, you know, Ukraine's counteroffensive has really struggled so far. Maybe we'll see things pick up. We're going to look at some limitations on this as well. Like here saying we're not in Crimea or Lugansk. And this bloke is an officer in the reserves of Ukraine. Well, and I just thought that was interesting. Now, going along uh, with weapons, things going in, multiple outlets have again reported that the American Abrams tanks will be soon delivered to Ukraine. Quoting Biden, saying, next week, the first US Abrams tanks will be delivered in Ukraine. So this is a long-awaited armoured asset and was really the fulcrum for a lot of further support for Ukraine. Once the tanks got approved, which weren't ever going to get approved in the start, then we had more weapons and stuff go in. But these have faced multiple delays and they are arriving right at the end of the counteroffensive. Like with all these weapon systems, just from when we know they arrive in country, time to the front line seems to be a long time. So we're going to have a look over the maps. And as well, what I want to do is actually have a look at the weather too. So we're getting to, you know, mid-late September now. So the 21st, uh, 22nd. And of course, this is around Robertini. Now, this is a 30-day chart. As I know, the further you go out in weather, the worse it's going to be at predicting. But this just gets an idea of where we'll start seeing these temperatures really drop off. So, you know, really about mid-October is when we're going to start seeing a lot of the rain come in, less sun and the temperature going down from there. And as you can see into early November, late October, a lot of rain, a lot of cold temperatures and plummeting then into winter from there. And like I think it was General Miley said, this was maybe five, six days ago, Ukraine has 30 to 45 days really left of this offensive action before the transition into what the winter objectives become. And we don't know what Russia or Ukraine's winter objectives are really going to be. So we do have some interesting updates, I guess, on the maps with the first real armoured vehicle seen uh, breaking at least through the Sorovikin line near Vobove 
as well. So let's actually have a look at where this is, where the geolocations are, all of this. So, of course, we have Ukraine, the capital of Kiev, red areas occupied since 22, and the purple since 14. So where we're talking is Robertini Front near Vobove here. Now, we're just going to go over this map a little bit because we do see that there was really not much change, but we hadn't had any change for a few days, and we see that Ukraine made a little bit of ground to the west of Robertini and secured a bit more to the south as well. And of course, we have Vobove here, and the actual... Um, front line hasn't really changed but what is interesting is where these vehicles were seen so we knew ukrainian infantry had moved forward up through these pits but not the armored asset to continue moving on through we know that armor needs to continue moving through there so russian pages actually released a number of photographs and you'll see that these are with russia today as well so these are both martyr and striker vehicles here from uh, Ukraine that were donated into Ukraine. This is from a Russian drone has seen these photographs. So then we've got some video of this too. So FPV drones flying around. You can see the shelling. You can see the pockmark of the ground of how much shelling is going on and these vehicles then here. Now, of course, where that has been geolocated to, well, let's just watch a little bit more of this too. So these vehicles and getting struck as well but oh, i should actually say these are these all these vehicles appear to be either abandoned or pre-destroyed but this has then been geolocated to this area here in between these two long paddocks which is map which is then these two long paddocks here so just here which is just in this location so has come through a lot of the um tank traps uh, the um, tank ditches right up onto then, I guess, this second line of defence, proving further that the armour is actually coming through rather than just the infantry there. But under heavy shelling, we know in these trench systems, there's still a hell of a lot of fighting, especially this second line with the VDV that has come down from Bakhmut pushing in on to Ukraine there. There's been a number of raids back and forward in the last couple of days to in that location. But that is interesting to see that there are a step up of armoured asset there too. And then this is what then uh, the ISW released, that this, of course, dark blue is the ground made of the last couple of days here. Now, this shows similar-ish to then what the deep state is actually showing of this cut in and not all of this. Then uh, this same claimed grey zone here, but they're not confident to say that Ukraine has fully broken through this line yet, either by this footage. So let's then have a look at um, what's it called? Syriac maps. The situation was at front. Ukraine army made small advances south of Robotini and southwest of Vobove along the Russian main defensive line. So it does show the southern push that we saw on deep state from Robertini and this sort of in the west, but this southern push that then we saw on the ISW. So I believe the ISW and this map, the, the Syriac is actually showing Ukraine hold more ground here than ISW and deep state are showing. We can see this corner here. So this is saying down in this region, which this is saying really grey zone, same as the ISW said just claimed. So we do know Ukraine is pushing and making some ground in there, but at this point it's still ground in a very beginning area of this offensive and war mapper show very similar here but does show that more area is cleared from i guess all of the maps here as well that is showing a lot more but interesting because war mapper is typically the most conservative to any gains made lost whatever in these areas so you know, we will start seeing maybe some more speed there once armoured assets come in, but this is still a hell of a fight. And I know people hate when I do this, but we need it, it, We need to be realistic that, you know, we are 9Ks in and to get to Tokmak, which is where a lot of analysts have said that you could really need to get a foothold somewhere major by, you know, by winter, we're still talking. Oh, I can't. Oh, no. What have I done? What have I done? Help. Here we go. We're still talking another 19, 20 kilometers. Now, I know things can speed up, slow down, but it's more than double the distance. Uh, 
and in a lot less time. And this is still fairly narrow across the top here. This yeah, It's still not pushing down like this. It's still very come in. It, it, that, that still opens the further and further you push, the more and more you need this flank security and the more your risk cut off. So along the top here is only 9Ks. So, you know, this is still a risk. Now, I'm not saying that this is going to get cut off. It probably can't. But it still hasn't created too much of a big salient around pushing in and capturing other villages. And like a lot of people said, every village in here is going to be a Robertini again and again pushing down. There's still going to be a hell of a lot of resistance. Russia's still making resistance in this. They're still bloody building areas. Now, on the maps, the only other little change we saw, and I can't see why this has changed, why Deep State has done this, but uh, down in the Herson Oblast, we do see that it does show Russia have less control down near Oleksky here, but it doesn't show that Ukraine has stepped up. It just shows less control in that area, at least if we're then on the normal map. It just shows that the grey zone has increased there. But we do know Ukraine has got a foothold around here, and this could be a very important area, especially coming over the winter in the south, a bit warmer here too. But on Deep State map, no other change at all. Now, we're going to come into Ruzani, around to the south, and we have, of course, Novodonetsk, Novomolsky here. And this proves, again, that Russia did have a jump up here from the last day. So look at this area. that uh, Russia did push that back, like we saw update on the deep state then yesterday in this exact area. For the load there, we see. Now, let's see what then uh, Suryak has to say about this. So shows the sort of same step here, southwest of Donetsk. Uh, during the last five days, Russian army managed to expel Ukraine army again from the recently captured positions of the Shatanka River and adjacent to the town of Novomayorsky. So that's what I like. I like when then all the different maps show the same bloody thing, at least within a day or two, then we know, yep, that happened. Right. Klishkivka, Bakhmut. Now, no other maps show changes here, but situation south of Bakhmut. After the recapture of Klishkivka, Ukraine army made small advances north of the town and close to the railway. So, Russia's still are right on the railway down through this region and have pushed up this tree line that will still hold near Klishkivka here, but Ukraine has captured the entirety, but just to the north here, have pushed more through from that uh, paddock into the tree lines there too. A little bit further up, where we're going to look is right up in the northeast, right up around Sinkivka here. We did see Russia making some ground, and a lot of the maps show a lot different in these areas. So let's just have a look here. So this was geolocated footage of a Russian army shelling Ukrainian positions. So we know Ukraine is still in Sinkivka, unlike some other, or well, the pro-Russian maps will say Sinkivka is under Russian control, but this proves that it's not. Situation on the northeast in the front. Recent video footage shows Russian army shelling Ukrainian army positions in the town of Sinkivka, which confirms Ukrainian forces have a presence in the northern part of the town. So the videos, are, you know, I can put them on the Telegram if you'd like to come and join. Now let's look then at what Suryak says as he's sort of overall how he sees the war. There are not many updates on the Ukrainian map these days. On one hand, the news of successful Russian counterattacks south of Bakhmut is not true with the front line remaining around the railway line, so that's around Klishkivka. The same is true further north, both in Zerebet, Salient, and on the Kupiansk front. Russia advances have been slowed again, and the northeastern front has been stabilised. It's just what we talked about around Sinkivka and then just south of there too. On the other hand, the Ukraine army is making little progress on the southern fronts. The Russians are holding positions around Robertini, Verbovi, while managing to regain positions southwest of Donetsk, with significant losses in the Ukrainian side. Everything seems to indicate that as today's autumn equinox, the Ukrainian offensive is losing momentum and will soon be unable to achieve the gains seen between June and August. In general terms, we're approaching a freezing of the fronts with the arrival of autumn which will in turn into an undisputed war of attrition. It remains to be seen whether Russia will contribute to this freeze or go on the offensive. So there are rumours that Russia is you know, building up forces, waiting for the ground, and then go on the winter offensive from there. I don't think that's likely, but anything could happen in this. Legends, that is all that I have for you today. Like I said again, the last couple of days... Not very much has happened. It's been very difficult. I don't want to speak about politics. It doesn't interest me. It's not where my 
um, it's not what I did for a profession. It's not where I actually know things about that, like I do on some frontline movements, bits and pieces. But thank you very much. If you'd like to support me, links down below. But otherwise, never feel obliged. Cheers. Have a great day. Oh, and have a great weekend. Fucking it's Friday. Look after yourselves.